Welcome back to the class with the name so long that when we finally decide to translate it into other languages, the Ents want to shorten the name. Yeah, there we go. There's a nice uh, niche joke for everyone, pulling out the Lord of the Rings jokes. <laughs> Next week, I promise I'll be more topical. <laughs> um, this week, we are going to hit shame and trauma. Um, and as always... I have to do this disclaimer every time. I am not a trauma expert. Um, I am an, as much as an amateur as a person can be. If you need to talk to someone about trauma, talk to our church leadership and they will get you in touch with uh, counselors and stuff that we work closely with who are trained experts. Right? I am not equipped to talk about this and all the talking about this I'm going to do will be coming right out of the books. Which, speaking of books, this week we're going to read a lot. So if you don't like listening to me read, you might skip this one because <laughs> this is going to be a lot of reading this week. And we're actually going to start off looking at Surfing for God, which I think is our first time pulling from this book. So to give it just a really quick little introduction, um, the name comes from an adaptation, let me check here, from a G.K. Chesterton quote. Uh, he wrote that he was talking about um, the, the hole that's inside each one of us, right? How we all have a, a God-sized hole in our heart, and we're all looking for something to fill in. And lots and lots of people suffer because they try to fill that hole with work or sex or alcohol or whatever it is they're trying to fill that hole with. And in reference to that, uh, Chesterton wrote that every man who knocks on the door of a brothel is knocking for God, right? That's what he's looking for. And so in the modern age, you might adapt that by saying every man who surfs the internet looking for porn is surfing for God, which I think is a kind of a nice, well, maybe not nice, but It's a take. <laughs> so we're going to start off with, this should sound a little bit familiar, but we're going to talk about an iceberg. This is the analogy that he uses in Surfing for God. And this is going to fall right into the same category that we've talked about with the idea of root, roots and branches of what's the root cause versus what the symptoms are. And so he says the tip of the iceberg that we can all see is our behavior. But most of you is under the water, right? There's lots of stuff that you are that never makes it out. We can see your behavior. We can see the stuff you say. But most of who you are is actually hidden inside of you. Uh, so we're going to go over. Well, I'll get there in just a second. All right. So reading out of Surfing for God. I don't have the chapter here. Uh, the visible tip of the iceberg represents our behaviors, conscious thoughts, and feelings, things people see and feel. The iceberg mass below the waterline represents those things that cannot be really readily identified. These include motives, purposes, and attitudes of the heart, as well as painful memories and hidden emotions. It doesn't take much to realize that a person can appear morally obedient, spiritually mature, and emotionally whole, Yet below the waterline remains self-centered and immature. It is below the waterline, however, in the place of our innermost being, where the gospel is meant to transform us. In the waters of our soul, something more deeply rooted must be addressed. But what is it? When Jesus taught that adultery and sexual immorality come out of the heart, he was not giving an anatomy lesson. In a heated conversation with the religious professionals of the day, Jesus had been discussing what makes a person clean or unclean. The popular teaching was that a person was unclean for not having followed certain ceremonial steps. But Jesus turned this teaching upside down. <clears throat> what goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. Uh, Matthew 15:11. His point was that no matter how many acts of obedience we perform, our problems are internal, not external. Our actions and behavior, what comes out of us, are just the tip of the iceberg. 
As if Jesus' impassioned discussion with the religious rule keepers were not enough, he went on to utter his harshest words yet to those who believe that God should be impressed with their moral performances. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. First, clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Matthew 23, 25, and 26. What this means for a man caught in the chains of porn and lust is crucial. If you could somehow magically stop looking at porn and exercise self-control in place of lust, you still wouldn't be dealing with the problem below the waterline. You've only cleaned the outside of the cup and dish. Uh, he goes on to say, he breaks it down into four categories, what we find under the water. He says there's wickedness, weakness, woundedness, and warfare. Four W's. I, we had a pastor years ago who, who hated it when the lesson all started with the same letter. He thought it was too cheesy, but here we are. So we're going to briefly hit all four of them. I don't want to dwell on them too long. Uh, starting with wickedness. A uh, great example here of wickedness is Calvin and Hobbes. <laughs> uh, if you don't know, Calvin is a six-year-old boy, and if you know any six-year-olds, they can be kind, and they can be creative, and they can be just little pieces of poop. <clears throat> I like this comic. Um, wickedness in this context is going to refer to, and I apologize for putting it this way, the joy that we get out of doing evil things, right? Because we all know people like that. There are, we, we know people who hear about terrible things and, and kind of chuckle or they get a laugh out of it. And when we were little, we all knew the kid who liked to roast ants or pull the legs off of bugs, right? They just got pleasure out of doing bad things. And that's because doing bad things is pleasurable. There's a um, YouTube channel I really like, and I wish I had looked up the actual quote, but I wasn't going to go over their entire channel, uh, called Cinema Therapy, where they delve into the psychology in a variety of movies. And they had this great quote of, when I do something good, I have a sense of contentment. Like, I did something good. When I do something I know is bad, I get a rush. Right? That's adrenaline. That's a little bit of a high. And the rush is going to feel much better in the short term than the sense of contentment. And I think it's a mistake to point at the kids who pull the legs off the bugs and say to ourselves, what's wrong with them? Or more accurately, it's wrong to say like, what's wrong with them? Because there's nothing wrong with me. The real answer is we all have that tendency deep within us, right? It's not a, there's something wrong with them. It's there's something wrong with all of us. And maybe for me, the wickedness doesn't show quite so close to the surface, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. So we have wickedness. Uh, the next thing that floats below the surface is weakness. Here's something men like talking about. <laughs> if you go into a job interview, one of the most common questions they'll ask you is, do you have any weaknesses? And pretty much everyone always immediately answers, yeah, of course I have weaknesses. I'm not perfect. But then the follow-up question is, and what are they? And we all go, hmm, you know, Huh, that's a really good question. <laughs> we, we all know to admit that we have weaknesses, but as soon as we actually start talking about it, and we, oh, what, what's over here? We're going to talk about something else now. <laughs> we don't like to talk about weaknesses, especially as men. And there's two way that we, ways, and I have these pictures up here, that we as men like to avoid encountering our weaknesses. The first is, on the right there, we put on a persona, all right? We fill ourselves with bravado. We put on an act. I am the big manly man who can take care of all the problems. I can handle it all. I can do it. I don't need nobody else, right? To act like we have it all together, to just deny our weaknesses and to 
make ourselves out to be these mythological heroes that we're not. The other way that we can deal with weaknesses is to run away from anything that might be remotely risky or challenging. Neither of these are very good solutions to the fact that we have weaknesses, and neither of them are very Christian. All right? Christ was perfect, but he was not an island. He had people around him. All right? The next thing that might be below the surface is our woundedness. And as we go deeper and deeper, we're getting more and more uncomfortable. <laughs> Uh, for this, I'm going to read right out of the book again. All right. Woundedness. When I am working with a man... Oh, just to clarify, he's talking about his uh, counseling practice here. Whenever I work with a man, I begin by asking him to fill out a detailed personal history. One of these forms takes an inventory of any wounds he might have experienced during his formative years. He is asked to answer questions regarding physical, emotional, sexual, and spiritual wounding and abuse. It's uncanny how so many men complete the entire inventory but leave the wound section blank. Dozens of men have crossed this section out or written N.A. to indicate that, their questions, that these questions were not applicable to them. But then, as I listen to their stories, my heart breaks. The man who, at the age of 13, discovered his father's body just after he committed suicide. The man who was sexually fondled by his scoutmaster. The man who, on the first day of kindergarten, learned that both his parents were killed in a car accident on their way to pick him up after school. The man whose father was a beloved deacon at church, but regularly raged at the kids and hit his wife. The man who teased who was teased and bullied through junior high because he wore braces on his legs. The man whose father told him about sex by handing him a box of condoms and telling him to be sure he didn't get a girl pregnant. All of these men initially reported to me that they didn't have any wounds. Not applicable. Not me. I'm good. None of them intentionally lied or tried to be deceitful. They had simply cut off that part of themselves in order to survive. The problem, however, is that the survival techniques that helped us go on when we were young prevent us from thriving when we are adults. Our solution becomes the problem. Until we realize that we are wounded, we will never recognize how we turn to porn as a balm to heal the injuries of our hearts. As men, we can admit our wickedness, and perhaps our weaknesses, but our woundedness touches something too deep, too tender. Our culture tells us that men should be strong and resistant, unaffected and unmoved by pain. Acknowledging our woundedness feels like a betrayal of our masculinity, but exactly the opposite is true. Our last W is warfare. And we've talked about warfare a fair bit, and so we're actually going to speed through it here, and I'm going to jump back to pure desire. And we're going to start in kind of an odd spot. We're going to start with a passage from Revelations, which is, let's, let's be honest, Revelations is a tough book. So we're not going to get into any of the tough spots, hope, hopefully, here. We're just going to kind of talk about a much more broader and safer topic. So, uh, let's see, this was John who wrote, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before God, our God day and night, has been hurled down. They tri triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. So, a couple things here. Let's talk about the context a little bit. Uh, first, 
John, who wrote this, uh, wrote this during his chain gang, chain gang experience, courtesy of Roman authority. Persecution had swept across Asia Minor, and churches were being horribly persecuted, uh, and John no longer led many of the churches that he had built and nurtured over the years. All right, to keep reading from Pure Desire. <clears throat> In a few short phrases, John wrote of Satan's savage evil, which is motivated not only by his treacherous nature, but also the fact that he knows his days are numbered. Even more important, John clearly reveals hell's central strategy and the believer's, nece and the believer's necessary response, which can break Satan's gri grip every time. In just a few masterful strokes, John outlined the ultimate spiritual dogfight that lies behind the daily struggles of our lives. The historical context of this passage reveals the intensity of John's conflict. He's an aged man. He had walked Palestine's dusty roads with the master. He had seen the blind receive sight, the sick healed, and the dead raised. He had poured his life into the churches in Asia Minor for decades, and he had watched his fellow apostles die as martyrs. Now he is in a chain gang, breaking rocks on the tiny island of Patmos off Asia Minor's southwest coast. On a clear day, he might even be able to see the smoke rising from the burning homes of believers being crushed under Rome's crippling assault. For the next two centuries, the church in Asia Minor would face repeated savage persecution. I really like this picture I'm going to put up here. All right. There's a little question in my mind, right at that moment, that John had to face the accusing words of hell. It sure pays to serve God, doesn't it? Everything you've poured your life into is going up in smoke. God hasn't even kept his word to you. The one who has accused believers since the beginning of time has been thrown down. Jesus Christ shed blood has removed the accuser's ability to bring accusations against us before God. But he has never stopped making accusations about God before us. Think back to Genesis, all right? What's the lie of the serpent? Did God really say dot, dot, dot? He goes on, um, Roberts in Pure Desire, goes on to talk about the blood that was poured out, right? Because he says, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. That's how we overcome the powers of hell. And he goes on to talk about, we tend to think of the blood of Christ being poured out on the cross, which is appropriate, I believe. Uh, but he actually says that there's four different places where Christ's blood is poured out um, after his betrayal. And if we start at the last one and work backwards, he pours out his blood on the cross. But before that, he poured out his blood at the whipping post. And before that, with the crown of thorns. And before that, in the garden, when Jesus prayed. Right? He prayed so hard. He was so distraught by the situation that the capillaries in his forehead burst. And he was bleeding sweat and blood. Right? And what was Jesus' prayer during that time? I, I like the Lord's Prayer. Big surprise, <laughs> considering we're in church. <laughs> I like the Lord's Prayer. Uh, it's a good, what's the word I'm looking for? Model for us to, prayer, to pray. But I really like the, the prayer in the garden, right? Because it's, God, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. But at the end of the day, not my will. May your will be done. All right? Jesus' first shedding of blood is done as a submission of will. With that, let's explore these four W's a little bit more in depth. So I'm going to keep reading from Pure Desire here. So often... Trauma becomes part of our lives because of other sin and abusive behavior. 
Time and again, research has underlined the fact that addictive behavior frequently is triggered by past abuse. For example, the crazy interpersonal games our culture has developed, for example, living at such a frantic pace, has resulted in family isolation, which is at the core of much child abuse and addictive behavior. As a result, ad adolescent drug use in our culture is soaring. All right. Let's see how many of these W's we can find in this. This is Robert speaking. I can remember my stepfather towering over me as, lay, as I lay on the floor in my room. He had been beating my mother and, just for fun, tried to drown her in the bathtub. I stepped in to help her and, as a result, I received his unleashed anger. He followed me down the hall and cornered me in front of my room. He lashed out, knocking me back into my room and onto the floor. I was like a mouse being toyed with by a cat just before the kill. I was a freshman in high school, and he probably outweighed me by a hundred pounds. And, like the crowd of soldiers that surrounded Christ, he took delight in delivering pain to others. He stepped into the room and bellowed, If you get up, I'll kill you. I wasn't a fool. I didn't get up. But I vowed that day never to let another man treat me that way. That vow became the source of a lot of the games I ended up playing as I grew up. I had to win. It wasn't really about the score. It was about never being humiliated by any man ever again. Consequently, the playing field became the arena of my self-vindication. Sports were not about the sport, but about the game I had been caught in years before. That's why, for years, I lived in a love-hate relationship with other men. I needed their affirmation. If we are never fully accepted by our fathers, we seek the acceptance of other men. Yet we don't receive it because, at the same time, we compete against them. I remember when I finally realized I had been living most of my young adult years in response to that vow I had made from my bedroom floor. Once I realized Christ's blood had been shed so that I didn't have to be trapped in the games people play, I began to experience indescribable freedom. The gospel really became the good news to me. So, in that story, we have what? Well, immediately we have weakness. He wants to defend his mother. He wants to defend himself and, and can't. He is insufficient. Probably much more obviously, we see woundedness. His word is he wants to never be humiliated like that again. He is physically hurt, physically wounded, but much more than that, there is relationship damage and emotional damage. Uh, we see a little bit of wickedness, at the very least, in the stepfather's actions. But we really see that this story for the author here is a big source of shame, at least in his earlier life. So, we're going to talk about shame. And it's in small text because isn't that how shame makes you feel? Um, I like to talk about things kind of logically and work through things just very systematically. But that's not how we're going to do it right now. I have three different books that I've been pulling from, and all three of them do the same thing. Though I'm not going to read from all three of them, just one tonight. Um, when they talk about shame, is they tell a story. So, I'm going to read you one of these stories. The story of the man, again, reading from Pure Desire, who I'll call Kevin, is like so many others. His home looked ideal. He grew up <clears throat> with two loving parents who made family a priority. What could be better? But Kevin's father disliked confrontation and conflict and gladly relinquished discipline of the children to his wife. During Kevin's first seven years, his dad traveled as a salesman three weeks out of every four, and when he was home, disappeared to the bedroom at the first sign of any trouble. Forced to function almost like a single parent, Kevin's mother used the only tools she was familiar with to ensure Kevin's and his sister's obedience, 
shame, and guilt, yelling and threatening. When Kevin was four, he wet his pants. He couldn't remember the events that led to his accident, but we, he will never forget how his mother handled the situation. She diapered him and forced him out the door while he screamed and cried. Kevin had to endure the jeering of the other children in their apartment complex as they laughed to see a four-year-old in quote-unquote baby diapers. That was the first day he felt shameful. Kevin also had to endure the frequent, why can't you be like Billy, refrain from his mother. He loved Billy, his older cousin, who later became valedictorian of his graduating class, leader of his church youth group, and a gifted college athlete. But Kevin couldn't measure up to his idol, so he felt defeated. He was sure his mother was ashamed of him and wanted him to be someone else. He tried harder to please her. Kevin's father urged him to be compliant in order to spare his mother, since she was also having to deal with his sister's rebellious attitude. His mother's shaming techniques and his father's avoidance led Kevin to a place of painful self-isolation. He became adept at showing everyone his good side and determined he would have to learn to solve his own problems in private. In his quote-unquote secret life, like many kids, he tried alcohol and cigarettes, but at about seven or eight, he discovered masturbation. He would go to his bedroom or the bathroom and experiment, more and more frequently. Then, when he was ten, he discovered the <clears throat> medication that had drawn his father to retreat to the bedroom at the first sign of conflict, a stash of pornographic novels and magazines. He found pleasure and gratification in the pornography and in the secret life of the sleuth. It became a challenge to borrow his dad's material and return it without being caught, all the while maintaining his good little boy status. His shame grew. He felt compelled to hide his attraction to girls when he became a teenager. During college, he felt free of his family issues, but guilt and shame drove him into an early marriage when his dating relationship with a high school friend quickly turned sexual. The marriage lasted two years, but Kevin's f fidelity was even shorter. His pornographic desires did not diminish with marriage, and he began an affair with another woman named Sandra. Kevin felt that they were more sexually compatible than he and his wife, even though they argued about God. Sandra talked a lot about God to Kevin, even in the midst of their affair. But he resisted her attempts to convince him of the reality of God because he knew that if he had acknowledged God's existence, he was in big trouble. After Kevin confessed his affair to his wife, they divorced and he married Sandra. Even before Kevin and Sandra were married, their connection grew more relational, with less emphasis on the sex. With the shift in their relationship and the fact that they were now married and were no longer having an affair, Kevin was more open to what Sandra had to say about God. Eventually, due largely to Sandra's recommitment to her faith and her persistent loving witness, Kevin asked Christ into his life. He and Sandra were working at building a good marriage, and he quickly grew to love Sandra's young son from her previous marriage. He thought he had the family of his dreams. The pornography battles were rare, coming up only when he went to his parents' house. He thought this war was won. He eventually got a ministerial license and became a pastor five years after he and Sandra married. In spite of Kevin's embrace of Christian teachings and his desire for a deeper relationship with Christ, something was still wrong. The shame never left. He had no self-value and couldn't see how God or anyone else could love him. He was afraid to trust God and was still positive he would have to solve his own problems. When Kevin first embarked on his secret life, he had bought into a lie. The fantasy of pornography corrodes the soul with the lie that, sex that sexual pleasure is immediate and e easily available. We don't have to deal with the challenge of relating to another human being. As we reach adulthood, we don't have to pay the price of mature love, putting someone's needs before our own. And we don't have to deal with the pain within. We can just medicate it with the endorphins and adrenaline generated from a sexual high. To put it bluntly, we don't have to grow up, emotionally or spiritually. One of the major differences between a man and a boy is that a man is willing to live a life of delayed gratification because he has committed himself to a higher calling. 
That is why the enemy tries so hard to plant the seeds of sexual bondage while the victim is still young. If the devil can sow the myth of pornography or some other sexual bondage, he can prevent the development of a warrior in the faith. That seed of pornography will grow in the man's soul until it can block God's call to self-sacrifice. Satan will even let some of these men become prominent in the Christian community so that he can infiltrate the church. But eventually, the hook in the leader's soul pulls him over the edge. That's why the man usually fights with all his might to retain his position yet at the same time is inwardly relieved when his secret is exposed. Finally, he can get rid of the hook that hell planted in the depths of his soul. Kevin's experience was no different. On the outside, things were going well. The little, the little church he pastored was growing, and so was his family. He and Sandra had added two more sons. However, in time, his compulsive addiction resurfaced and grew and he took great pains to hide his feelings of shame and worthlessness. Once an addictive lifestyle is established, the act itself, masturbation, pornography, prostitution, etc., is not the critical issue. When an addictive perspective is firmly in control, the addict often switches specific expressions of his bondage to add a greater high or to avoid detection. We all have the foundational elements of an addictive perspective. We want to make it through life with the least amount of pain and the highest amount of pleasure possible. God doesn't call us to seek pain in our life, but in a fallen world, constantly seeking to avoid difficulty only leads to further pain because it makes us into masters of the quick fix. And this quick fix attitude often leads us to respond to life's challenges through fantasy or obsessive thoughts. As the obsessive thoughts increase in intensity, the hook is set and the corrosion builds. The addict has then learned that if he doesn't like the way he's feeling, just thinking about sexually acting out generates a subtle mood change. Each time the scenario replays in his head, he falls into deeper sexual bondage. The illusion of control and power. The illusion of control and power over pain is tempting because we don't want to accept the truth of the bondage and the increasing pressure of the shame. That's why the person thinks the problem exists outside of himself or that the bondage is simply too big to overcome. Therefore, the destruction continues and the sense of shame deepens as he heads for the inevitable crash. And this brings us to revisit something we've talked about before that is we've talked about the sexual noose before but we primarily before focused on the addictive root and we've been talking about the addictive mindset not explicitly but we've been brushing up against it but uh tonight i want to actually hit the addictive life life cycle which is the one thing on here that is actually a cycle uh, let's see. So, once again, reading right out of the book. Starts with fantasy. Uh, the cycle begins as a preoccupation or fantasy. I prefer the word fantasy because we are battling with a cleverly crafted lie from hell. The addict's thoughts have become focused on a sexual lie created through pornography, memories of the past, adultery, or just mental images. The mental focus is not the casual, fleeting, intense sexual thoughts all of us have at times, but a prolonged, intense focus that brings a mood-altering high without actually acting out. It becomes a mental state of arousal that can blot out the current demands of real life. It is a buzz that the individual cultivates as a coping mechanism. Even when he was young, Kevin spent more and more time in sexual fantasy. I want to draw attention to what I just read, in case it wasn't clear. What the author is saying is that not watching porn, just thinking about watching porn, produces the same kind of emotional and uh, hormonal high, which, if the whole point you're watching porn is to deaden the sense of pain, and thinking about it produces the same chemicals, if even if just a lesser amount, then just thinking about it, will also produce that pleasure and thus deaden the pain. 
which on the one hand, if your goal is to deaden the pain, that makes it super useful. But that's not our goal. Back to the text. With this obsessive fantasy in place, control rapidly ebbs away. And once a certain level of preoccupation dominates the thinking, it is nearly impossible to shut down the process. This mental phase of the cycle can consume enormous amounts of time. In fact, most of the person's time is in the, addic in the addictive cycle is spent in this phase. He truly is living in a fantasy world. That takes us to the next step, which is ritual. Eventually, the preoccupation will move to the stage of becoming a ritual. Rituals are an important part of all our lives. Uh, real quick, these are the habits. These are the things you do the same every day because it's easier to just do repetition than it is to resolve the same problem every single day. You probably get dressed the same way every day. That's a ritual because you found out what works for you and you stuck with it. <laughs> Back to the text. We frequently use them to bring comfort at times of crises or conflict. The person caught in a sexual bondage will do the same thing when he faces stressful situations. He will seek the comfort of his rituals. Rituals that might include any of the following. Driving by an adult bookstore, cruising the street looking for prostitutes, going to the singles bar, turning on the X-rated channel, uh, looking at someone in the office who we find sexually stimulating. A large part of the angu anguish with sexual bondage comes from the tension and struggle with the compulsive desire. The addictive ritual eases that tension, but once the person is involved in a ritual, the choice has already been made. It's only a matter of time. That's why he is essentially working at keeping the lid on. Rituals come in all shapes and sizes, even reactive ones. For example, a husband may pick a fight with his wife and then act out sexually as a, <laughs> out of supposed self-righteous anger. I know it sounds crazy, but we are talking about sexual bondage, not about a balanced life or thought process. One of the most common rituals practiced by Christians who are in sexual bondage is to live constantly in crisis mode. They are always fighting the devil, going from one stress situation to another, constantly living in overload. The sense of impending disaster fuels the sense of being out of control. I need a high if I'm going to make it, they say to themselves. In fact, I deserve this release. This is a frequent thought in the back of a sexually out of control pastor's mind. He has given so much to others all day, or week, or year. He deserves this sexual release. The thought is so crazy he may not even voice it, but the myth still triggers the destructive response. Again, this harkens back to week one when we talked about how the enemy manipulates us and keeps everything nice and hazy. <clears throat> the final step in the cycle is obvious, an even, greater, an even greater sense of shame and guilt. After several laps around this track of insanity, there is no way out. It takes a pig pen to bring us to our senses. But even then, we will not move if we have a distorted view of our father. The prodigal, the prodigal son, left the pig pen with loads of shame. He told himself he wasn't even worthy to be called a son. He would go back as a hired hand. But he knew his father was gracious, so he went back despite his shame. The addiction may have corroded his soul, but in his heart he still knew he could go home to his father. Which this will bring us to... The next step, which I kind of like, which is after all those, <clears throat> we have some principles we can learn from the story of the prodigal son to counteract each of those steps. The first one is always welcome. <clears throat> Many times I have treated God the Father like the prodigal son did, and so have you. I have cried out for the quick fix, which is always the slogan of a person in bondage. I have demanded that God bail me out fix me up, and move with power on my behalf. Lord, just solve this problem. I don't want to wait. I need help now. What I'm really saying is, I don't want the pain of having your character worked into me. But here's the beautiful part. No matter how many personal pig pens I have created by my own choices, he has always welcomed me home. We also have a patient father in the second step here. 
In the parable, the father did not go and drag the son out of the pig pen. And God the Father will not do that for us either. Because he loves us so deeply, he will give us the dignity of choice. The one thing the prodigal son had left was his freedom of choice, and his father would not take that away from him. So many folks in the midst, in the midst of sexual bondage ask God to come and bail them out. They want the Holy Spirit to come and zap them and change everything. He won't do that, because God's purpose in our lives is to heal us, not enable us. Through the years, I've learned that we can't help people until they want help. The final thing here is sacrificial response. <clears throat> I have always enjoyed picturing the scene in Luke 15 of the father running to the prodigal son. But not long ago, standing outside a village in Israel, I realized as never before the power of that scene. Previously, I had pictured the son walking up a long roadway to the family's huge farmhouse, like a plantation in the Old South. Then, I realized the story was set in the cultural context of Palestine. The father's house was part of a village, and as the son came through the surrounding farmer's field, the word would have spread. The whole village knew of the son's return. The father could allow the son to make the long, shame-filled walk to him, or he could sacrificially run to the son. He chose the latter. When the father met the young man, he hugged and kissed his son. Our Heavenly Father never asks us to, con to come groveling to him because of what we've done. He never exposes us to public shame. But he does ask us to make an effort to step out of the pig pen and head home, admitting that we need help. God's Son was nailed to the cross so that we would not have to be impaled on the agony of our addictions. He was publicly humiliated and shamed so that we could be free from shame. That's the core of Christianity and the answer to every addiction that buffets men's souls. We're getting close to the end here. So I want to read a little bit from the end here. <clears throat> uh, this is a testimony given by Gene McConnell uh, of a dream he had. Uh, Jean, saw himself in the dream sitting in a courtroom. The prosecutor stood to present the case and began by pulling down a screen showing a video of Jean's life. Every sordid detail. Pornography, adultery, lies. He con the prosecution concluded the case by saying, this man said he was going to stop his behavior and he never did. Look at how often he promised to change, but he lied. Gene could only bow his head in total shame. The defense attorney stood to present Gene's case. He declared, Everything the prosecution has shown you is true. Every detail is correct. All is except one. He left out a key ingredient. Everything Gene did was paid for. Then his attorney pulled off his shirt and showed the scars on his back and asked that they'd be entered as evidence. He showed his hands, feet, and side and proclaimed, I don't deny that Jean has done what he has done, but it has already been paid for. That leads me to the last little thing I want to say tonight. And it's in the middle of the chapter, but I feel it does better here at the end which is counseling is important. This class is not a replacement for really getting help. Small groups are essential. Understanding the noose of addiction is vital. But the cross of Christ is the only thing that can set us free. That is what this, <clears throat> that is what this class is about. Um, and I'll be a little bit open here. When we were putting together this class, um, I was timid about the name, in particular the word successful. I was like, if people come to the class and they feel like they don't get help, I don't want them coming at me and thinking that is false advertising. And one of our pastors was like, 
Nate, what did you just tell us in reference to this quote? He's like, do you really believe that? I'm like, yeah. It's like, then these are the tools to successfully combat pornography. If people don't use these tools to their full extent, it's like, well, then there you have it. They didn't fully use the tools. But that's what sold me on the word successful <laughs> was this right here. This is the tool that this whole class revolves around. Counseling is important. Small groups are important. Understanding yourself and how hell works are all important. But the cross of Christ is the only thing that can set us free.